So what is TinyML? Well, it's machine learning on, you guessed it, tiny computers. And even though we have a lot of powerful machines these days in our pockets, even, and on our laptops, a lot of devices are actually really small. But even those super small devices can actually benefit from being able to do machine learning. And that's what TinyML is all about. Machine learning models require a lot of training. And as we're looking at things like image processing or speech, not only is data constantly flowing, but that data is also really large. And companies are actually building bigger and bigger machine learning models. So we started training larger and larger machine learning models. We started adding more layers to our neural networks, and we started training these larger models with so many parameters. And these massive machine learning models can't fit on microprocessors. And microcontrollers are everywhere. In an average house, you're gonna have three dozen of them just in your home, and your car has also about 30 of them. And these microcontrollers are really tiny. The Nordic processor used for tiny ML test projects has just 256 kilobytes of RAM and one megabytes flash. So compare that to your laptop or the machine learning models that are available today. For example, GPT-3. GTP3 has 175 billion parameters and was trained on 570 gigabytes of text. But wouldn't it be so useful if we could do machine learning on these microprocessors? We have so many of them. As it turns out, the Google Assistant can actually detect speech and words with a model that's just 14 kilobytes in size. So that can actually fit on a microprocessor, but GPT-3 definitely can't. So if we can make these machine learning models smaller, we can actually harness all these microprocessors that we already have in our houses and our cars and do really cool things with them. This is one of the ways that we can actually do edge computing. And what edge computing means is actually doing the computations where the device is, instead of sending that data out to the cloud or somewhere else. So why do we even care about these sensors or care about the data being processed exactly where it is? Why can't you just send that data somewhere else to be processed? Well, you can, but in some applications, things like latency are important. And again, the size of these microprocessors is really small. For super time sensitive applications, that latency or delay is an absolute killer. For example, a self-driving car avoiding an accident needs all the time it can to process the data. The latency could be the difference between life or death. Sensor data is constantly being collected around us, but a lot of it actually gets thrown away because we can't process that amount of data. Sometimes we can't even send it back. One example is microsatellites that actually capture images. Obviously our cameras nowadays are really high resolution, but that's a lot of stored data. We can send those back to Earth, but that takes a lot of time, a lot of processing, and a lot of storage too. So what ends up happening is that we end up compressing those images and sending maybe a partial sample of them back to Earth. Or we even store those videos at a very low frame rate. What if instead, on the fly, we could actually have a machine learning model decide which images are important? keep those around, keep those high resolution, and choose those ones to send back to Earth? Or what if we could even do full data processing aboard that satellite if we have a very small machine learning model? That would actually be a game changer for the science that a lot of these microsatellites do, because they do things like warning people of disasters coming up and seeing fires that are spouting out, so this could actually be very important. And beyond that, with very efficient machine learning models, it means that actually the battery life and the power that's used is a lot less which means these devices can stay on for longer. And this is important for applications like hearing aids, for example. This one paper talks about doing ML on hearing aids, and I'll link all these papers below. But the cool thing is, as actually the battery power could last over a year. Now, say you want to get started with tiny ML. What platforms are required, and what do you actually need to get started? As it turns out, you can actually use Python. And I know, it's such a magical programming language, it feels like it can do pretty much anything. And there's even Python frameworks for this. One of them, for example, is called TensorFlow Lite. Check out the Google website for a bunch of quick start guides and tutorials. You can learn to do object detection and audio classification, like hot word detection. So when you say Alexa or OK Google, this can be done within the microcontroller. And yes, you can do all of that today. Of course, you don't have to stick to just microcontrollers. You can actually use TensorFlow Lite on Raspberry Pis, and that opens up a lot more applications for this tiny ML. People have proposed tiny ML solutions to real-time traffic data, enabling more smart home and even smart factory applications for more efficient work, and even apply it to the care of farm animals and being able to monitor them more closely. So where can you learn more? There's this one amazing website that I found and it's actually for a Harvard course that's running right now on introductory tiny ML. 
They post readings, some videos of guest lectures on the website, so I really recommend checking that out because they have a bunch of free resources and videos available on the topic to get you really excited. There's also an O'Reilly book called Tiny ML, Machine Learning with TensorFlow Lite on Arduino and Ultra Low Power Microcontrollers. And now there's even a professional certificate program on edX from Harvard. That means you can go really in depth actually and actually go through a few courses in the certificate program. This starts from fundamentals of machine learning, deep learning, and embedded devices. What kind of data you need to gather for training machine learning models, covers coding in Python and TensorFlow Lite to train and deploy these tiny ML models, and goes through optimizing them and designing your own applications from scratch. Now, the funny thing is this course, this book, this website, they're all kind of run by one person and his name is Pete Wharton. He's the lead of the TensorFlow mobile embedded program at Google and he has a lot of really lofty goals for TinyML. Now, obviously Google is deeply involved in this space from the TensorFlow application side, but they're also working on the hardware, but also a lot of other companies are getting involved in TinyML. Apple is said to have some work brewing in the field. They actually acquired a tiny ML company not too long ago, and that makes a lot of sense. So for example, your Apple Watch can detect heart conditions. And Qualcomm, a big chip manufacturer, is obviously interested. As the amount of data grows, we need to optimize more and more. DigiKey also has a great blog post on training a model on Arduino. And to learn even more and keep up to date with events, check out the Tiny ML Foundation at www.tinyml.org, where there are even upcoming conferences on this topic. And remember, I've linked all these resources below to help you get started. So I hope you enjoyed this quick introduction to Tiny ML. And yeah, I'm actually really excited about it for multiple reasons. First, it takes me back to my days of doing embedded systems and robotics, which I think is really cool. But I also feel like these days, because we do have so much computing power, everyone's first instinct is just to throw more machines at the problem. And because I am a performance engineer, I'm definitely really interested in this optimization space. And throwing machines at problems just generally costs a lot of money and actually being able to optimize these things and actually have smaller models means we can harness more power on the same size chips. Or like I mentioned, the tiny ML harness the power of these sensors and microcontrollers that we already have in our house that aren't really being utilized to their fullest. So there's a lot of interesting optimization problems I think in this field from not only shrinking the models, but also optimizing that code. So now I get a question, do you actually have enough background to do this? So I personally am not a computer scientist. I'm not a machine learning expert. My background in machine learning was taking the Andrew Ng machine learning course and deep learning specialization. And then I bought the Ian Goodfellow book on deep learning as well and that's how I learned. Now that's all to say I'm not a PhD expert and I haven't studied this for 10 years but I found that between these courses and the books available and also the strength of TensorFlow Lite and the hardware available it's actually pretty easy to get into it with a little bit of machine learning and coding background. I personally felt pretty comfortable with the material so I think a lot of people could get started with this field right now. So let me know below if you're going to try and explore tiny ML.